This week on Adventist News Network, promoting reconciliation in Ivory Coast. Adventist Radio Ministry reaches India. And eye exams for school children in Togo. These stories and more coming up. This is Adventist News Network, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, Adventist World Church President Ted Wilson is meeting with government, community, and church leaders in West Central Africa this week. His first stop was Ivory Coast, where the World Church leader called for reconciliation following last year's civil unrest in the wake of disputed elections. He said reconciliation should start in the home, the neighborhood, and the church. Local officials say Pastor Wilson is the first world religious leader to bring a message of reconciliation to the country. In the 1980s, Pastor Wilson served as a regional church leader in Ivory Coast. He still speaks fluent French and delivered his keynote message in the language. Pastor Wilson also visited neighboring Ghana during the tour. The communication department in the church's West Central Africa region sent this report. On November 8, 2012, the General Conference President, Pastor Ted Wilson, arrived in Accra, Ghana on a five-day visit as part of his official visit of the West Central Africa region. Ghana has 400,000 Adventist baptized members. As his father 24 years ago, Elder Wilson visited in the city of Kumasi, the Asantehene, King of the Ashanti. In his speech, Pastor Wilson told him of an Ashanti carving present received by his father from the previous king. The gift, as you may know, is a, a hand of carving of a hand with an egg. And the explanation of if you are too hard on your people, you crush the egg. If you are too relaxed and not interested in your people, you relax your hand and the egg falls. <laughs> So, he says, those in the church also believe in it. After the visit, Elder Wilson inaugurated a multicultural center sponsored by the General Conference of the Seventh day Adventists with headquarters in Washington, D.C. It is now my official privilege to open this building. Amen. Amen. Besides evangelistic training, it will be used for skills training for non-Adventist youth in the community in IT, catering, and sewing. It would also house the English church of the local conference. Hello and welcome. We are the Babayara Sports Stadium in Kumasi, Ghana, where the General Conference President, Pastor Ted Wilson, is worshipping with tens of thousands of Adventists in Kumasi. It was such a, an exciting opportunity to have the high representative of the King of the Ashanti Nation come to this event where Seventh-day Adventists have gathered to celebrate the Lord and to become enthusiastic about revival and reformation. To have the high representative of uh, the Asantehini, mm -hmm. the King of the Ashanti Nation, was a great privilege. I greet all of you. An Indian FM station aired the country's first Adventist radio program this week. Produced by Adventist World Radio, the program aired in the city of Hyderabad in East Central India, where Telugu is widely spoken. The radio ministry arm of the church just signed a contract with a broadcast agency in India for a series of 11 programs in the Telugu language. AWR officials say additional broadcasts in Hindi and English are planned for cities such as Mumbai, Bangalore, and Delhi. Previously, Indian listeners could only hear AWR programming through shortwave radio, on-demand, and podcasts. 
Church leaders in North America want to make Adventist education a reality for more students. Through an online distance education system, they hope to reach the 70% of Adventist students not already enrolled in formal Adventist education. Called Education for Everyone, the system will meet the needs of students at non-Adventist campuses and homeschooled students, as well as students in traditional Adventist schools. Education leaders say the new focus on distance learning could also help bring quality, low-cost professional training to pastors and lay members. Education for Everyone will depend on a close partnership between the Church in North America and Griggs University, the Church's distance education provider. We need to find ways that we can deliver education in an effective, quality format that is affordable to the parents. And so I think that we, if we can do that to the small school, to the junior academy that wants to have additional classes um, for grades 11 and 12, and for the homeschooler, if we can do that, we will increase the number of students that we have in Adventist education. More than 1,000 school children in Togo are seeing clearly thanks to a project sponsored by Adventist Humanitarians. The Blindness Prevention Project recently provided eye exams, checkups, and operations to underprivileged school children in dozens of villages in Togo. Eye diseases are prevalent in school-aged children in the country, but early treatment can often restore sight. The project was funded by the Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Germany and carried out through a collaboration between Adra Togo and Adventist Eye Hospital in the country and the Christian Blind Mission. And finally in the news this week, Andrews University is vying to become the most vegan-friendly campus in the United States. The Adventist-run school in the state of Michigan has provided all vegetarian food since its founding more than 135 years ago. As vegan diets have grown in popularity in recent years, so have the vegan food options at the Andrews Cafeteria. The university is one of eight schools in the small U.S. school category, still in the running after two rounds of voting. The poll is sponsored by People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Welcome back. Let's turn to Kimberly Moran for a look at this week's issue of Adventist Review. This week's Adventist Review contains a variety of articles on really interesting topics. Our cover story written by my colleague Molona Karamabadi goes into detail on Florida Hospital spiritual ambassadors. These ambassadors are employees who go beyond the call of duty, not only caring physically for patients, but nurturing them spiritually. The program can best be described as a two-way outreach. To learn more about this exciting program, read the story at www.adventistreview.org. You'll also want to read Gerald Klingbeil's editorial entitled Wild Goose Chase, which exposes the dangers of nostalgic living. Klingbeil asks, how can we find the right balance between yesterday, now, and tomorrow? Another topic is addressed in Alexis Goring's article geared toward young adults. The title says it all, premarital sex or purity. Goring writes about what society and culture expects and what we should expect from ourselves. This is a good one to share with your youth group and the young adults in your life. 
Again, to read these and more, visit www.adventistreview.org. When a global mission pioneer moved to China to start a church, she sought lodging from an elderly local woman, but found much more. Rick Kajura has this story. A few weeks ago, I was in the country of China visiting with a global mission pioneer. Well, the truth is she's not a global mission pioneer anymore, but she was. Back in 2003, she went to this village to start a new group of believers. She looked for a place to stay and found a place with a lady we'll call Popo Dao, which means Grandmother Dao. When she found this place, she started, and soon she had a small group of believers worshiping and studying the Bible with her. One of those people was Popo Dao. Popo Dao owned some land there, and she let them build a small church building where they could meet each week. But one day, the global mission pioneer was out on the street, and she saw somebody lying there in a pool of blood, and she went over, and it was Popo Dao. They took her to the hospital, and the doctor said, we don't think she's going to make it. So the pioneer called all the believers together, and they held an all-night prayer vigil praying for Popo Dao. Popo Dao got better, but they realized that if anything happened to Popo Dao, the land where that church would be might be gone and they might lose their place of worship. So Popo Dao decided to give that land to the church so that would never happen again. When I met Popo Dao, she's 79 years old today and she's still worshiping in that church. Global Mission Pioneers are making a difference and if you'd like to find out more, visit www.global-mission.org. For our Adventist social media feature this week, Megan Bronner asked our Facebook and Twitter followers to share stories of Thanksgiving. Next week, those of us living in the United States are celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday, but you don't need to live here to take a moment to think about your blessings. That's why this week we asked you what you're thankful for this year. For Twitter follower Boaz, blessings come in the form of serving others in Africa. He says it's been amazing to see how God works. Also on Twitter, Gabby says she's thankful that she's finally reunited with her husband after an eight-month absence. Shells says she's grateful for the strong woman in her life, her supportive mother. Lena reminds us of something that many of us forget to say thank you for. She's grateful for a sound mind and a healthy body. Anna offered us some frank insight saying she is thankful for a God who never lets her down, even though her church sometimes does. On Facebook, Vusi says he's thankful for a God who gives him everything he needs, no more and no less. And many, many more of you shared your stories of thanks for your family, for your children, for good friends, and for steady jobs. Our last thought comes from Twitter follower Kat, who reminds us that we all have something to celebrate. She says she's thankful for being forgiven. If you have a Thanksgiving story to tell, head over to the Adventist Church accounts to tell us all about it. A study released in September by the Pew Research Center points out that religious restrictions toward all faith groups are on the rise. Dwayne Leslie reports. According to a recently released study, threats to religious liberty around the world has significantly increased of late as more countries impose severe restrictions on religion while harassment and intimidation of religious groups has surged. The annual survey by the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life found that the percentage of the world's population that was affected by restrictions on religion increased to 75 percent, up from 70 percent from the previous year. The net effect of this increase is that there are hundreds of millions of people who are now living under restrictive conditions who weren't living under these conditions the year before. The study specifically highlighted recent trends such as actions by governments to ban particular faiths or prohibiting conversions, mob violence against religious groups, or harassment over religious garb. Government restrictions on religion and hostility involving it were highest in the Middle East and North Africa, most notably in Egypt, but the reported data did not include the Arab Spring uprising that dramatically impacted the region. It will be very interesting to see just how religion will fare as various factions continue to fight for power and influence in many of these countries. Though the United States was recognized as one of the countries with the lowest levels of religious restrictions and hostility, the Pew researchers noted that acts of religious terrorism, like the Fort Hood, Texas shooting rampage that left over 13 dead, as key factors in the increase in the nation's 
increased social hostilities index. My department will continue to monitor international religious freedom issues and will bring you additional reports from time to time. So I ask you to please continue to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters across the globe. Still ahead on Adventist News Network, a food ministry reaches community members in Siberia. But up next, this week's Tech Corner. When I read through The Great Hope, I came across a comment that gave me great hope. The comment is from Tyndale to the papacy, and this is what he says. Do you know who taught the eagles to find their prey? Well, that same God teaches his hungry children to find their father in his word. And I thought, isn't that the truth? The reformers from studying scripture got the strength and the courage that they needed to face all the trials, tribulation, and persecution that came their way. And for me, that is a great hope, because in studying the Word of God, I can get to know my Father, and I can also have the strength and courage to face the trials that come down the road in my life. Welcome back. If you've ever emailed a Word document to colleagues for edits, this week's Tech Corner is for you. John Beckett shares an easier way to handle group editing projects. Today we're going to talk about Google Drive, a great way for groups of people to work together on documents. Google Drive is free online office software that includes a word processor, spreadsheets, and presentations. Since it's online, you use it by logging into the Google website. Documents are stored online instead of on your computer. This means you can work on your documents from any internet-connected computer. For me, the best thing about Google Drive is the ability to collaborate on documents with a group. For instance, I'm now working on a project with people located in Washington State, California, Mexico, Australia, and Missouri. Yesterday, we had a lengthy video conference where we opened the same shared Google document and worked on the plans. We could all see the changes others were making to the document. This way of collaborating is so much easier than emailing around a Word document. If you're working on a project, you might actually have a whole collection of documents to share with your team. Instead of sharing each document individually, make a folder in Google Drive and share it. Now any document you put in the folder will be shared with the group. I've used Google's Drive and Documents for years now and it's still one of my favorite web tools. It just keeps getting better every year. Give it a try the next time you're working on a group project. An outreach project in Russia that began with food distribution is spurring church growth in the region. Heather Don Small has more. In February, a program called Bread and Cereal was started in many churches in the Eastern Conference of the Euro-Asia region. Women take an active part by preparing tasty food. To begin, advertisements were printed and church members put them up. On the first day, six persons came, twice as many staff members baked pies for the event. Those who came were dumbfounded at the respect which was shown to them. The church members got acquainted with the guests and gave them packs of cereals and a loaf of bread, some pie and tea. The program is both social and spiritual, and guests were invited to a film at the next program. After the film, people asked questions on the theme. Each time this was held, a few more people came, though advertising was now just word of mouth. Within two months, 25 to 30 guests were coming. The group has now grown to 60. As Adventists, we have a life-changing and practical message about health. When a person is fed and given a kind word, it may be the very thing to attract attention to the Bible. This program may not work quickly, 
but the results are more lasting. Funds are used not for advertising, but for meeting people's needs. Some guests already wish to be baptized. When was the last time you organized your medicine cabinet? As Peter Landless explains on this month's health feature, there's no reason to store old prescriptions. It happens to all of us that we need to sometimes take a course of medication, be it an antibiotic, pain tablet for a surgery, a sprain, a fracture, an anti-inflammatory. But I wonder when it was last that you took the time and the trouble to go through your medicine cabinet. You know that cupboard that you open every morning when you take out stuff to get your teeth cleaned and, and, and uh, do your shaving, whatever it may be, if you're a man. And um, look at what's in that medicine cabinet and see whether or not some of them are expired. And I'm looking at some that I see should have been thrown away some time ago. It's also important that if you have a course of antibiotics, take the entire course. Finish it, of course, unless there's an allergy which precludes that you complete that course. But finish the medication course the way it should be taken, and then once medications are completed or there's a stock left over, then to turf them out. You don't need them, throw them away. What's important? Young people, children, particularly children, may get to them and take them and then we may be very, very sorry about that. Overdoses can be lethal, particularly in children, but also in adults. Take the time, go through your medicine cabinet, throw away what you don't need, and be cautious about keeping anything that's not necessary in your medicine cabinet. When we come back after the break, the news you've reported this week. You know, the book Great Controversy, I think, means so much to every one of us who are Seventh-day Adventists. This battle is not, is not something that is just played out in my life, but is played out in the whole cosmos. It is something that uh, Adventists identify with, especially when we look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Welcome back. Let's turn to Lauren Lombard for this week's iShare report. Welcome to iShare, where you bring the news to us. This week, Communication Director for the Greater New York Conference, Rohan Wellington, sent us a story about the destruction along the east coast of the United States after Hurricane Sandy. Here I am standing on what's left of the Far Rockaway boardwalk. As you can see, the debris has piled up here to my right. Uh, the streets are covered with uh, sand coming all the way from the ocean. If I step down here uh, from off this boardwalk of what le what's left of it, and if I go over to my left over here, you can see over in the distance that there you have only the piles with the concrete that's left of what used to be the Far Rockaway boardwalk. Many people used to come out here in the weekends and the nights and used to take in the fresh air of the ocean and look over. Now there is no boardwalk. To enjoy. Visit adra.org or gnyc.org to learn how you can help. And don't forget to send us your stories. You can submit your videos at news.adventist.org slash iShare. A ministerial training program at Southwestern Adventist University is grooming tomorrow's pastors. Lisa Beardsley Hardy has more. One of the great things about my job is I get to travel and visit Seventh-day Adventist universities and colleges around the world. Recently, I was on the campus of Southwestern Adventist University for a visit of the Adventist Accrediting Association. They have a great theology program. Students in that program are assigned to a church, and they become part of the pastoral team already as a student. 
They do all of the things that members of the pastoral team are expected to do, involved in the church service and Sabbath school, even on weekends and evenings. They will go to hospitals for hospital visitations, do Bible studies, and be involved with things such as weddings or board meetings of a church. By the time they graduate, they understand what it is to be a pastor. They've got good experience, and the conference knows them. Graduates from that school get hired at high rates. Great program. Also, they have an honors program. It is a wonderful program for the student that likes extra challenge, that wants to broaden their view and isn't afraid of a little extra work. It also includes evenings and weekends going to the community. Dallas-Fort Worth is right nearby and they've got museums, the concerts, a lot of cultural events that surprise me. And they have a trip that takes them this year to Europe. Honors Program, Theology, Southwestern Adventist University. Check out all of our universities at Adventist Accrediting Association. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, war shapes the landscape of the church in Europe. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On November 11 in 1918, the First World War ended. On the 11th hour of the 11th day, of the 11th month. It was a notable conflict for Adventists because Adventists in most European countries supported conscientious objection, the church's traditional position, but church leaders in Germany supported military service and a minority of German Adventists therefore broke away from the main church. The resulting rift continued to affect the denomination after the war and it severely affected Adventist growth across Central Europe. Also on November 11, but 33 years later, in 1951, 4,237 lay evangelistic meetings took place simultaneously across the United States. They had been launched by the 120 Club of Seventh-day Adventist laymen, businessmen who wanted to support the church's outreach. Sixty years and a day earlier, on November 12 in 1891, Ellen G. White departed the United States bound for Australia. She lived there for nearly nine years until August 1900. On November 16 in 1896, Oakwood Industrial School opened in Huntsville, Alabama with 16 students. A dedicated school for black Americans, it was opened thanks to the efforts of Ellen G. White and the GC president, Ola Olson. The school later became a college and today is Oakwood University. And on November 17, in 1842, Joshua V. Himes published the first issue of The Midnight Cry, an influential Millerite periodical. That was this week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching Adventist News Network. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. In the meantime, check out our Facebook page. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to all of our stories photos and videos. Just visit facebook.com slash Adventist News. Our good news for this week comes from Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's our show for this week and remember you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless.